Most known for his heroic leadership of the 300 Spartans during the Battle of Thermopylae in 480 BC, recently immortalised in the Gerard Butler movie 300, King Leonidas has come to represent the epitome of fearlessness, bravery and courage in the face of death. But who was he really? Was he this heroic saviour of the western world? A warrior for justice and freedom? Or was he basically a homicidal maniac like most people we read about from this period? Sparta had a mismatch government. There were two kings elected from separate families, a general assembly of the people, a council of elders and a group of elected ephors who regulated the king's behaviour. Fortunately for the young Leonidas, he was born into one of the royal families of Sparta, a family who happened to claim descent from Heracles himself. Unfortunately though, Leonidas was the product of an incestuous marriage between his father the king and his father's niece. With two older brothers and therefore unlikely to ascend to the throne, Leonidas would likely not have been spared the brutal training required of Spartan boys. For this was a culture designed to break the weak, to mould its male citizens into hardened warriors, to annihilate the individual birthing a slave to the collective. The first trial came at birth. Spartan children, if deemed defective or weak, were taken to the foot of Mount Tagatus and left to die. If, however, allowed to live, you would be raised by your family and at seven years old taken to a kind of boarding school, stroke athletic club, stroke torture camp, to prepare you for a life of military service. Here you would practice your wrestling and gymnastics all mostly naked. You are encouraged to fight your fellow inmates, uh, um, I mean fellow trainees, and would be repeatedly beaten, especially for talking too much. You sleep on a makeshift bed of river reeds and are half starved to encourage tall, slender frames and good looks and stealing, uh, and self-sufficiency. If caught, a letter was sent home to your room. No, only joking, you were beaten. Not for stealing, but for getting caught. By your early teens, one of the older adolescents would pick you out and become your lover. If you survived all this without dying, at twenty you are let loose into the countryside with a knife and license to kill a helot. And the helots were people from Messenia, from over the other side of Mount Tagatus, who had been enslaved by the Spartans. They literally would do this, usually once a year just after a new group of ephors were elected, walk out into a Messenian field, grab a slave and kill him. As well as a rite of passage for Spartan men, it was also a self-consciously kind of terrifying proto-eugenics. The Spartans would select the biggest or strongest helots for slaughter, or those that had shown any particular initiative or bravery, in an attempt to breed in a kind of genetic servility into the slave class, mimicking, but in reverse, the artificial selection they imposed upon themselves at birth. You know, like you would a dog or a horse. And so Leonidas, having done all this, now finds himself a full citizen of Sparta. Further luck strikes when one of his brothers dies fighting in Sicily, and his second older brother, the one chosen as king after his father had died, goes mad and dies hacking bits of his own flesh off with a knife. Although just as plausible, Leonidas may have had him killed. Anyway, in duly elected king after the death of his older brothers sometime around 490 BC, he, of course, marries his half-niece, Gorgo. Okay, so blah blah blah, he owning Greek rebel against Persia, uh, Athens trying to help but all ends in disaster, small Persian force invades Greece, Athens fights them off but Marathon 490 BC got that's all put to bed. But there's a catch. Unfortunately for the Greeks, Persia, the greatest and most powerful empire the world had yet conceived, could not countenance a defeat at the hands of these terrorists go at the end of the world, so in 480 BC, get serious and assemble the largest invasion force in history to march on Greece. This force not improved upon until D-Day 2424 years later. 
that time for Leonidas as the Spartans are celebrating a kind of harvest military festival called the Carnia. So he can only take himself and 300 of his bodyguard. The rest will catch up later. Elsewhere, the cities that would have backed them are also competing in the Hacking Olympics. Athens are busy defending the Aegean with their navy. And so Leonidas marches to meet the Persians at the narrow pass of Thermopylae. He's got his 300 bodyguard, and a mixture of the Thebans and Thespians who are willing to join in, about 7,000 in total. The Persians outnumber them about 40 to 1. There is some good fortune, as the oracle at Delphi had prophesied that the Persians can be beaten. The bad news for Leonidas is that in order for this to happen, a Spartan king descended from Heracles must die. This, of course, means Leonidas. So the Greeks build a wall to better defend against the expected onslaught. The Spartans do what comes naturally, and they strip down naked, start exercising and combing their long hair. Basically, they know they're going to die. And of course they do. Xerxes, the Persian king of kings, sends his troops to smash the Greeks. He even sends in the elite immortals, initially, no success. But, after two days, a local Greek, Ephialtes, showed the Persians a mountain path that could be used to outflank the Greek line. Leonidas, learning of his inevitable doom, sends the bulk of the remaining Greek alliance home. Of course, the Spartans remain, accompanied by a small contingent of Thespians and Thebans, who together bravely fight on to protect the retreat. Well, the Thebans give up pretty quickly or run away, but the rest fight to the last, even once their weapons are broken with fists and teeth. When finished, Xerxes, wading through the rotting and steaming refuse of the battle, finds Leonidas' body and orders his head cut off and put on a spike.